In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This being my only chance for sure to send uh, greetings from the Shota House, I don't want to miss the opportunities. You, you know, there is probably no more encouraging place for people from the Shota House to be than Church of the Redeemer in Sarasota. We never receive a warmer welcome than we do here. And so thank you for letting us be your guests this weekend. Um, with me is uh, Robin Little, who is our recently appointed Director of Advancement, sitting right there in front of Malaysi. Robin, that's Malaysi. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. She helps you understand Charleston. <laughs> it's a delight to be with you and thank you for over these many years and, and so much so recently your generosity to Nishota House in, in sending us wonderful students. We, we try to send them back in good shape <laughs> and uh, in receiving our students back and in certain cases sending them on to other places. Uh, this is a good thing we have going. Let's keep it up and thank you so much uh, for all that you do for us. Now, it's Lent, and I should stop flattering you because that would be against the spirit of the uh, season, I suppose. But again, thank you. We're so glad to be with you this morning. Apparently, some things never change. People talking about other people disparagingly and making confident judgments against them without knowing all the facts of the matter, that's not a recent phenomenon. It's what people do, and it also happened to Jesus, and we read about it this morning. The tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, the text says. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. An indictment. Now, if there's a single indubitable fact in the historical record of Jesus, it is that he spent an inordinate amount of time with the persons who were most despised by the most allegedly righteous people of his day. This would be nothing all that remarkable in itself were it not for the fact that he also belonged to and founded a movement on repentance and moral transformation, and that he taught an extraordinarily rigorous ethic, and he bid his followers to a wholehearted devotion to God and to love of neighbor. These two practices, teaching and practicing an unprecedented holiness on the one hand, while keeping the worst possible company on the other, were obviously incompatible to first century Jesus watchers, the religious pundits of his day. Were it the 21st century, they would play clips of him saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, mashed up with video footage of him in the home of a notorious woman or at the dinner table of all the worst bureaucratic crooks in Israel. The images, of course, would speak for themselves. His behavior proved fraudulence, uh, uh, the fraudulence of any other claims he might wish to make. He was, as they like to say, after all, a glutton, a drunkard, and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And the memes to this effect surely circulated around Galilee all the way up to Jerusalem, and had he any political aspirations, which he didn't, they would have been shipwrecked summarily. Not just in the first, but in the 21st century as well, this combination of utter holiness and reckless association with the unholy remains the rarest combination, even among Jesus' professed followers, that's us, in the present day. And if we ask why he did this and why we don't, the answer is found in the stories he told to his grumbling critics. Now, of course, these stories that follow are very well familiar to all of us. Three stories in which there's a search followed by a recovery leading to a celebration. These stories conclude with the most personal and moving of all of them read this morning and we know it as the prodigal son. Now, this is not a hard story to understand. It easily transcends time and place. 
But if we attend to the details of the story with first century Middle Eastern eyes, what has become familiar and possibly even bland to us becomes startling. And if we let it, life-changing. The story opens with the announcement that a man had two sons. We already know there's going to be a problem. (laughs) There are virtually no ancient stories, including from our Bibles, in which a story with two sons does not contrast them, good and bad. So we are not surprised when the youngest son announces his desire to depart from his family. But we ought not to mistake this request for departure as though it were a choice to backpack Europe rather than go to college. When he asks for his share, the share of his father's estate, he is not asking for some spending money. It amounts to asking that his father would be as good as dead to him. Of course, in any culture, but especially in this culture, it is the gravest offense when tending to one's parents to the end of their lives is the highest sacred duty, it is the highest offense to ask for his inheritance early, to wish him virtually dead. Indeed, when the text says that the father divided his property, his living, between them, the word there is bios, bio. It means life his life's work, veritably the father's life, was divided among his sons and then squandered. And the son, going his merry way, left a father behind without his life and as good as dead. There's enough offense here to constitute the whole story, but as you well know, it gets immediately worse. Irresponsibly, and as the text implies, immorally, this young man squanders that whole nest egg. Meeting famine, he hires himself out to an unclean Gentile to become a slave to the most unclean swine, envying the very food that these unclean animals were eating. Now, everything in this story is calculated to provoke the hearer's utter revulsion at this point. And if at this point in the story you, like me, feel some kind of pity for the young man, it could only be because he's not your son (laughs) who did this to you. Or more likely, our compassion stems from centuries of thanks be to God reconditioning, of reading this story and trusting in the God whom it reveals. But trust me when I say this is not a natural reaction for anyone hearing the story in the first century. Of course, the story takes a turn. When we are told that the young man comes to himself, it would be easy to mistake this for the beginning of a spiritual conversion, a kind of repentance. But the text does not support this interpretation. Coming to himself is enlightened self-interest. He does not make his confession to God. Rather, he makes a plan with a confession embedded. There's a big difference. It's a scheme. He decides what it will take not to be restored to his father's graces. He assumes that ship has sailed. But how to make his pitch, which he now rehearses. When he asked to be made as one of his hired hands, his father's hired hands, while that request may sound humble, it may simply be the best that a groveling man thinks he can hope for. This is a plan, it's not repentance. Now a funny thing happens between the rehearsal of the speech and the meeting of his father. As best we can tell, it is not something that happens in the heart of the young man but something that has been true of the father from the moment he lost his son. We learn that he sees him coming from a long way off. And there are no perhaps more poignant words in all of the Bible. He sees him. 
from a long way off. Sit with that. The only way you see him coming from a long way off is to have been looking for him this whole time. You see, like the shepherd who had lost a valued sheep and the woman who had lost one-tenth of her dowry, the father has been preoccupied by one thing and one thing only since his son left. This son who wished him as good as dead. For this reason, the young man's encounter with the father does not go as the son plans. Most noticeably, he fails to finish his speech. Did you notice? He doesn't say, make me as one of your hired hands. He simply confesses his sin and unworthiness. What happened? We saw what happened. What happened is that the father's welcome changed his plan. The text says that the father was so moved by compassion that he went running out to greet his son. And in language more colorful in the original than we can get to in English, it literally says that running, he fell on his neck and kissed him. He ran and all but tackled his son. (laughs) He lost all control. He lost all his dignity. It is often said, because numerous ancient sources say this, that older men in ancient times would not run in public. This is my excuse, by the way. (laughs) It offends sensibility and decorum. Nobility and self-respect are indicated by the slowness of one's gait, Aristotle said. So why did he run? Why did he tackle his son? Well, the obvious answer is love, compassion, longing. But there may be another subtext, known to Jesus' listeners and not so much to us. It is well attested that a child's offense against his parents in the ancient world was also an offense against the whole community. And in solidarity with the shamed parents, a community may well lock arms with the parents to shun the child permanently should he ever return. Indeed, there was a ceremony for just such an occasion, banishing wanton persons permanently from the community. So it may just be that the father's self-humiliation, running to tackle his son, was not born only of compassion, but of desperation to be the first one to meet him lest he be banished permanently. What we know is that running and hugging and kissing and giving robe and ring and sandals all said the same thing. That's enough. You're my son. As you know, this parable is known to us as the prodigal son. But the word prodigal, if you look it up in a dictionary, refers to reckless extravagance. And when applied to the son, it refers only to the first few verses from the opening scene. But this parable is not a story about the son's prodigality. It is a story of the reckless extravagance of the father's love. It is the parable of the prodigally loving father. You see, what the scribes and Pharisees could not understand about Jesus is how much he took after his father. His relentless love for the lost and discarded persons was nothing other than the literal incarnation of his father's love for the whole world. And he would lose none of his own holiness, but rather reflect the true character of the father's purest holiness every time he embraced the world's prodigals so to sanctify them in the Father's love. It may seem strange to us that a story so saturated in love and grace should be the text for the Lenten season that we so often associate with austerity and discipline and judgment. But this is to misunderstand both the love of God 
and the grace of Lent. This is the perfect text for Lent. It is the starting point on the fourth Sunday of Lent. You see, the grace of Lent is not to restore us to God's favor. The disciplines of Lent are the graces, the gifts offered to us for transformation by a God who says, that's enough, you're my child. Confessing sin and pledging amendment of life and breaking the dominance of our appetites are the means not of becoming favored of God, but they are the gifts whereby we lay true claim to our sonship by taking after the mercy, compassion, and holiness of our Heavenly Father. It is our willing cooperation with a loving Heavenly Father who has more glory and more joy in store for us than we could imagine for ourselves. If you might wonder what could happen to you or any, to anyone else should you turn to God, Jesus answered that question for us. Wherever you might find yourself in your life, whatever mistakes, whatever wrong choices, whatever hurts you have caused yourself or to others, there is a Heavenly Father perched on a rooftop who has been waiting for you to come home from a long way off and he sees you. You see, our repentance does not earn his grace. His grace invites our repentance. So let the Father hug and kiss you this Lenten season. Let him put on you his robe of righteousness. Let him put on your finger the signet ring of your sonship. Turn to him and you will find him ready to meet you in his mercy. Turn to him and receive your full adoption. And then turn to the world and tell them all about the God who stands ready to meet them too. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.